From CPRI and the CPRI Knowledge Hub, this is Research Minutes, a weekly look at new and important research in education. Today, we look at childcare and a new statewide study examining the impacts of COVID-19 on provider costs, operations, and potential closures. From those results, we estimated that up to 4% would be permanently closed and an additional 16% were seriously considering closing. We welcome Phil Serenides, Associate Professor and Director of the Institute of State and Regional Affairs at Penn State Harrisburg. Serenides discusses what his team learned about providers in the Keystone State. During the shutdown, we found that providers used all available cash that they had, and that presented a new challenge when reopening to be able to hire back staff because tuition and subsidies often lag behind payroll. And his recommendations for policymakers, providers, and other stakeholders in the uncertain months ahead. We're going to probably see a period of time in which providers will need additional support or at least access to funds such as loans in order to bridge the gap between where they are now and getting back to full enrollment. And it's not clear how long that will take. That's right now on Research Minutes. Hello and welcome to Research Minutes. I'm Keith Umeller, Managing Editor of the CPRI Knowledge Hub. Uh, Today we welcome Phil Serenides, Associate Professor of Education and Director of the Institute of State and Regional Affairs at the Pennsylvania State University at Harrisburg. Thanks so much for joining us, Phil. Good to be with you, Keith. So before we begin, uh, I do want to mention that Phil and I have worked together on a couple of different projects, uh, first in his time here at CPRI and uh, now the CPRI Knowledge Hub has helped produce a series of blogs and podcasts for AC DataWorks, which is a national initiative led by you, centering on early childhood integrated data use. Uh, today, though, we're discussing your new impact study, which was co-authored by researchers at both Penn State and CPRI, titled The Impact of COVID-19 on Pennsylvania Child Care. It's now publicly available on the Institute of State and Regional Affairs website, And it offers a pretty sobering look at the state of childcare here in Pennsylvania in the wake of the pandemic. So given the similar reports we're seeing in other states, it probably has some important national implications. But to start, uh, could you walk us through the study itself? Um, What kinds of questions did you have about childcare in the wake of COVID and how'd you go about answering them? So this, this project was in partnership with the Pennsylvania State Early Childhood Office. In 2019, uh, we started uh, a research study with them that looked at the cost of delivering child care. Data collection uh, began in the fall of 2019, and we were wrapping up analysis and, and getting ready to release that report when we found ourselves sort of in the pandemic. So we were able to expand the effort and to then look at the impact that COVID-19 was having on child care operationally and financially and used much of the data that had been collected prior. We used the ingredients method, which is an economic method of cost analysis, first uh, developed by researchers at Stanford and then really kind of refined and expanded by um, others at Teachers College, and has become a very useful methodology for doing cost analysis, uh, looking at cost effectiveness and cost benefit for education studies of impact. Um, But we use the method in a slightly different way uh, to be able to look at all of the resources that are required for childcare and to come up with a comprehensive list of what those are and then assign prices to each. So when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, we were then able to go back and identify which of these costs will continue to accrue even during a period of shutdown. And those largely focused on the facility expenses, either mortgage or lease payments, utilities, and and, and property taxes. And we had very good information as to sort of what share of the total cost of care those represented and what the actual dollar amounts were. And so that was one area that we were were able to uh, examine. Another was the payroll. During the shutdown, we found that providers used all available cash that they had. And that presented a new challenge when reopening to be able to hire back staff because tuition and subsidies often lag behind payroll. 
And so another area that we were able to identify is the, the cost of that two-week floating payroll that many providers um, sort of think of as the minimum amount of working capital that they require to operate. A third area that uh, leveraged our st- uh, existing work and then moved into the new study was then going back to sites that had reopened or were planning to and looking to see what changes are being made to comply with the CDC health and safety guidelines. And that involved mostly personnel um, because not only was there uh, sort of new protocols for cleaning and sanitation, although most of that can be done during the day and that represents no additional cost, there were some additional hours often that, that we found staff needed to work in order to do all of the cleaning. Um, but also some of the, the safety guidelines around pickup and drop off or modifications to uh, various group activities that had been part of a normal day, many of which required additional staff. For example, if you're going to have staggered pickup and drop off to limit the contact that families have with each other, well, that just means you need to have somebody out at the front door. So we were able to uh, identify those staff costs as well as some equipment costs, uh, temperature taking, uh, personal protective equipment, and then the cleaning supplies themselves. And so it was helpful to be able to then look at the marginal increase in cost associated with all of these new protocols, including some of those purchases, and come up with a per child per week expense that's uh, associated with these, these new health and safety guidelines. And those three main areas were the basis for our recommendations. The facility expense during shutdown, the startup costs associated with rehiring the staff, which we identified as a two-week payroll, and then a period of time in which we identified from reopening to Labor Day, which was an arbitrary endpoint, to be able to calculate, well, what would be the costs now for implementing all of the health and safety guidelines? And using that as the basis for for some recommendations on how the state can structure some some new grants that will go out to providers and hopefully help them remain open and operational. So in this impact study, your team actually reports on childcare provider closures and some uh, prospective closures down the road. But before we get into that, uh, I wanted to know how how did we get here in only a matter of months? What financial, operational, I mean, even enrollment impacts did the pandemic have on, on child care providers here in Pennsylvania? The child care market is one that is, is, one that is very fragile uh, because they just operate on, on, on very thin margins. And maintaining full enrollment of, of the capacity to serve children is understood in, in, in sort of this industry to be essential for, for remaining operational. And what does that mean? Well, because of many important uh, regulations that pertain to staff-child ratio, as well as the maximum number of children that can be uh, cared for based on the type of provider, but also in the same room. With those regulations and, and sort of procedures in place, it's very important for providers to make sure that they have 100% of the available slots enrolled. You know, there's been a lot of economic research on the child care industry. And much of it going back has looked at the availability and access of child care and how that relates to workforce participation, especially of uh, women and it, even more specifically in single adult households. And there's quite a bit of research that supports the link between increasing access to child care and increases in labor force participation, as well as constrained access and how that can have a negative effect on participation. There's also been quite a bit of research that's been done, and I'm thinking of the work that done out of uh, by Cornell University uh, researchers there that's looked at the stimulation to the local economy for dollars spent in childcare. And Cornell research has showed that of all of the various industries, childcare has actually the highest amount of stimulation of the local economy. Childcare is both an area that that folks have looked to for um, supporting workforce. Sp- participation among families, when thinking about even supplying opportunities for children so that they will be equipped to start school ready and be eventually productive members of the workforce. But also, this is a sector that really benefits others in the local economy. So this has been a reason why it's been, it's been an in, exciting and interesting to see how the research supports 
the, 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 the need for greater investment for children, for families, and for the economy in child care. And yet, child care providers find that they can really scrape by, barely make it um, based on the amount of tuition that families are, are able to, to um, spend and also the amount of subsidies that they have through, through various uh, federal programs such as the Child Care Development uh, Block Grant. But how did we get here? Um, we got here because even with great investments and with an understanding and appreciation for the importance of this sector, it is expensive. In fact, the research that we've done has shown that the per child per week cost for delivering care is two, uh, $290 per week per child. And that cost has some variation and it certainly increases based on higher quality because the majority share of cost is related to personnel and staff who have higher degrees, you know, of attainment, uh, educational attainment, you know, that you have to pay those folks more. And so higher quality care really does mean that it's going to be higher cost. And uh, to operate within ratio, within the regulations, and to provide quality is just something that, that is, is not cheap. So it seems intuitive that, you know, with everything shutting down, revenues would go down. But an initial reaction for some might be, why wouldn't child care programs simply reduce costs? Um, if your program's closed or if you have significantly reduced attendance, shouldn't your expenses go down as well? Um, why do you think that this is particularly devastating to the child care sector? Well, it's certainly true that when we were in a state of, of statewide closure, the staff were furloughed and, and were no longer you know, receiving payment. That was one way that providers could reduce cost when they had no revenue. And uh, it certainly did um, reduce cost for that period of shutdown. However, there were other costs that continued. Facility expenses was, was one of them, and, and those bills needed to be paid even when there was no revenue. As providers are reopening, they will still have some efficiencies, but there will be costs associated with rehiring staff, which you need even if you don't have full enrollment. And so this this idea of Reduced enrollment or reduced uh, attendance is is one that's very significant for providers. They don't know necessarily what the demand is going to be now and as the school year begins. And so it's difficult for them to make decisions about how many staff members they're going to need. And so large providers that have, you know, perhaps multiple classrooms that all serve children at the, at the same age level will have the greatest opportunity for efficiencies so that if there's, um, you know, reduced enrollment, perhaps you could combine three classrooms to two and then no longer pay the staff that are, are in, in, in the one class that was eliminated. But if there are small reductions in enrollment, then those are not necessarily going to be things that can easily be offset. You'll still need to have the same number of staff and, and you'll still have the same regular expenses. And this is also true for small providers, such as family home providers that serve up to six children at a time, you know, if you have five out of six or even two out of six uh, children who are enrolled, all of the other expenses are still going to apply. And so the efficiencies are only there for a large provider and only there when you have significant changes where you can scale up and scale down. But these smaller reduced enrollments on, you know, in terms of the number of children there or the total capacity are just hard to offset. And so we're going to probably see a period of time in which providers will need additional support or at least access to, to funds such as loans in order to bridge the gap between where they are now and getting back to full enrollment. And it's not clear how long that will take. And as you note uh, in this paper, some child care providers are simply not going to survive. Can you give us some numbers on how many providers we've seen close here in Pennsylvania already and how many might continue to close or simply not reopen in the months ahead? Yeah, uh, we, we gathered data fairly early in, in the uh, shutdown. So our information was coming from uh, April, May, and we did rely on self-report here. It was a large and representative sample of providers, and we did ask about their intentions and we're able to gather a lot of useful, uh, you know, detailed information about that. From those uh, results, we estimated that up to 4% would be permanently closed 
and an additional 16% were seriously considering closing but had not yet made the decision. And from that, we projected that 280 providers would permanently close, but up to 1,000 would be at risk. And at that time, we we still didn't see the numbers. Um, In June, it was, I think, 128. Um, By by July, it was over 200. So unfortunately, as as the numbers uh, you know sort of come in, we are getting very close to that four percent closure that that came from the self report in the sample, and uh, we also are concerned with uh, the numbers of providers that have not yet taken advantage of some of the state grants, and that seems to be because it requires an attestation that they'll be open for at least the next six months. And many providers haven't taken the money because they've been concerned about whether or not they're actually going to be able to follow through on, on being open for six months. And so, you know, we're, we're hopeful that a lot of the investments that are being made now by, by Pennsylvania with the CARES Act funds will help give the confidence and sort of reassure providers that they will be able to remain open um, so that they'll, they'll feel comfortable also taking advantage of some of these great opportunities to, to use CARES Act funds. Uh, Finally, um, Pennsylvania had previously dedicated funding from the Federal CARES Act to support child care here in the state. And I understand the state's Office of Child Development and Early Learning is using your team's recommendations to guide an additional $116 million for child care. I'm sure there are many listeners out there who are curious um, what your recommendations were and what you hope to see here in Pennsylvania in regards to the child care sector moving forward. Um, yeah, we had recommendations in really three areas. Uh, the first was additional financial assistance. So the results of this study find that at minimum providers require financial assistance for facility expenses during the shutdown, for the sufficient liquidity to rehire their staff, that first two-week payroll, and assistance in implementing the COVID-19 health and safety guidelines. And the combined costs for those, those were approximately $209 million statewide. The second recommendation uh, is that the state support providers in reopening to offset reduced enrollments. And for that to really be done effectively, a little bit more information is needed. And so the state is now working to update some of their data system capacity. So by October, we will have some, some more reliable and timely information about attendance and enrollment and, and reduced capacity. But that information could very well be the basis for additional grants or other types of supports that are more targeted to providers, especially in communities that already have sort of constrained access, what are referred to as childcare deserts, to ensure that families can access care um, that they need. And the third recommendation focuses on some communication and public awareness about the importance of childcare and the fragility of the system. It was challenging for providers to access information about what was happening and what was available to them. And so having a really strong communication strategy, both with the provider community, but I think also with many other stakeholders and leaders in the state are going to really be important for them to support child care through this through this next phase. Well, this is just fantastic work, Phil. And uh, of course, it's incredibly timely. And we encourage our listeners to go read the full article again. It's titled The Impact of COVID-19 on Pennsylvania Child Care, and it's now available on the Institute of State and Regional Affairs website, which you can find at isra.hbg.psu.edu. Phil Cernides, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Keith. Thanks for listening to this week's Research Minutes, presented by the CPRI Knowledge Hub. For more episodes or to subscribe to the series, you can find us at researchminutes.org. To share thoughts on today's episode or to suggest a future topic, you can find us on Twitter at CPREHUB. That's C-P-R-E-HUB.